Okay, so on three things, open flow, SDN, and NFV. Now, none of you said NFV, but uh, it's all there, basically. NFV is the last thing that has happened in this series. I'm going to talk about those three things, open flow, SDN, and NFV. Uh, roughly, open flow is going to take most of the time, actually. It turns out hour and a half of that is goes there, and then other hour and a half goes into SDN and NFV. Um, and to begin with, let me just say one thing which is different about this lecture is that SDN is not open flow. Okay, and, and that is what I talked this morning at 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 um, Baumam, and so so this is the common mistake in the in, in academic environment that people are equating the two as same, and when they say we are doing an SDN, they really mean they're working on open flow. So I'm going to first explain open flow, and actually most of it because that is most of the material here it is, and then we go into SDN. Okay, so basically in open flow, we will talk about um, planes of networking, open flow, and then uh, what are the different switches, how it is evolved from one version one to one, 1. 1.3, and then there are other protocols such as configuration protocol, notification protocols, and the controllers. When we go to SDN, we're going to talk about what is SDN, and then what are the other protocols which are used in SDN, and then open daylight controller. That is what today SDN is. Then we go into NFV, and we talk about what is NFV, what is it, how is it related to SDN, what is HC, which is the European Technical Standards Institute, HC doing on NFV, and where it is right now. So with that, in part one, we'll talk about open flow, and I already said a minute ago what these different eight parts are, so I'm going to get into planes of networking. So networking is designed as four planes. Two of them are on this slide, two of them are on the next slide. Four planes. First is the data plane. What happens is on a network, when a user sends a bit, that's the user bit, and we call it a data bit, and that is that bit actually is called in the data plane. So basically everything that goes on the data plane is data bit or user bit. But to send that bit or byte, the network has to send many more bits or bytes. Okay, in particular, the network has to find the route. So it has to send some routing messages to find out what the routes are. That is not sent by the user. That is control. So anything that is not sent by the user is control bit or signaling bit. And, um, and so we have to distinguish between the data plane and the control plane. Data plane, data bits, user bits. Control plane is everything not sent by the user. Now, for the time being, because next slide I'm going to say it slightly different. But the idea is that in the phone network, these are very well separated out. In the phone network in the beginning, they used to have the bits go on the same wire, whether it is data bit or control bit. Actually, they didn't have a bit in the beginning. They just had the tones. So your voice will go on the same wire and, and the dial tone will go on the same wire. In those days, people could make a phone call by putting a special tone device in front of it. And Steve Jobs did this, you, you all know. He made phone calls without paying for them because he could break into the control plane using data plane devices, right? And so after that, the telephone company became smarter and they separated out the two networks, two planes by two physical networks. So today, the phone company, and not today, maybe, you know, some time ago, ago, they had two networks. One data network, or user network, and one control network, which they call signaling network. Totally separate, physically separate. So you could not send a bit on the signaling network from the data network. So you could not play that game that Steve Jobs could play. All right, however, today they have missed it again. Now today what they have is a virtual control plane. So in the sense that the wire is physical wire is same, but some bits are some channels they call them are for control and some channels for user. And um, so that is the telephone network. In the data network, actually the situation is very messy in the sense that first of all, they didn't really think about separating the two right up front. So every packet that you send in that there is a data bit and there is something other than the data bit, header. That header was not sent by the user, but added by the network. 
And so that is control. And not only that, the packets also go on the same wire. So if you send a packet saying that I'm a router and the route to X is this, you can do that today. And, 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 and many routers will accept it. And they will think that you are a router. So you can still play those control games on the IP networks. In fact, some, uh, some ISP in Pakistan said that I have the shortest path to YouTube, or I forget the, which company it was, maybe YouTube, and then all the traffic for YouTube went there, you know, because they have the shortest path. So now that has been fixed probably, but the idea is that the control plane and the data plane are very much intertwined in the IP network. But you understand what these two planes are. Now, I want to separate out control plane and then there is something called management plane. So basically the extra bits that you see on the network are of two kinds. One that are really essential for the operation of the network, such as routing messages. Without routing messages, the packets will not go anywhere. If you don't know the route, packets will not go anywhere. So that is control. There are some messages which are really optional, such as if I send a message to the router saying that how many mess packets have you sent? and it says 2000. So th those are management messages because those really are not required. If I didn't ask and if it, they didn't tell, the network will still work, right? And so the management messages are to try out the faults, are to, to, to configure a network, are to accounting, are performance, are security, FCAPs is the standard management thing. And um, so, you, so management in the IT network was centralized from day one. This is interesting, that while we didn't care for the control and data, the management was separate and it was centralized. So you can, sitting at one place, you can talk to thousand routers and say, please tell me your configuration or do this or change your configuration. And then there was one plane that we didn't even know up until very recently, service plane. And the idea was that soon we discovered that we need something more than just the routers, which are load balancers, intrusion detection devices, firewalls, SSL offloaders. These are all services that we need in the network. And these we started calling them middle boxes, but there is no place in the, you know, in this whole three-dimensional state diagram that we use for IP to show where they belong. So we have four planes, services, management, control, and data. Okay, and now, so basically, we will talk about control plane quite a bit. That's why I wanted to make sure everybody understood. The control plane are the bits which are added by the network and which are essential for the network to operate. Okay. Managers, like any other company, managers can get sick and can be fired and nothing really happens to the company because they're optional. Okay. <laughs> All right. But the control staff has to work. All right. So with that, we go back to the router are a switch, and in a switch, generally, there is a CPU, and there is some logic. So there is something called data logic that runs at the line speed, like 100 gigabit per second or 400 gigabit per second, whatever the line rate for that switch is or for that port is, it has to run at that rate. So this is very hardwired stuff, okay? And then there is a CPU, which does the control, which is the one that sends out an OSPF message or you know, RIP message to find out what the route is, and that is done at a very slow pace, right? There's no need for it to run at 100 gigabits per second. So that is done by the CPU. So the idea is that there are two parts, control logic, which is generally the CPU, the processor, and the data logic, which is generally special hardware, which runs at a very high speed. And um, so the data logic is generally TCAMs, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the control is, you know, CPU, which is very slow path. All right. So, so it occurred to some people at Stanford that we should separate these two out. And so they came up with this protocol, open flow, which I'm going to talk about. And they said, there are three things we need to do. First is separate the control plane from data plane. Second thing is centralize the control plane. And third thing is that we should have the control information only flow based and I will explain that in a minute. So basically not, so, so basically, um, so that will be clear in a minute, but anyway, so open flow. The way it happened is that in 2006, 
when the United States started doing research and next generation clean slate networking. Martin Casado, a student at Stanford and Berkeley joint program, he came up with the idea that we should have a clean slate security. And the security at that time and even today was done at the periphery. So what we do is we put a firewall at the edge of the network, right? And once the packets come, if the packets, when they come in, they don't, they can't get into the network. Once they get in, then they can go into any room. Then inside we don't check, right? So he felt that was wrong. And um, so his idea was that we should check at every door whether this packet is allowed to come into this door or not, inside the network. And uh, so basically he said that every switch, we should have a program that in enforces security. And, and then there is somebody at the central place which tells them who can come in, who cannot come in. If you're not sure, then you just ask them and they will tell you, or you know, you have some rules. And so, so he called it SANE, which was the SANE was the program which was funded by NSF, National Science Foundation. And then um, he, next generation of that was called ETHAN, again, security project. And then the next generation was called OpenFlow. What happened was during this time, they realized that it's not just good for security, it is good for any other policy that you want to enforce. And so if we can use it for routing, we can use it for policy saying that, well, this is, this is a university packet or academic packet, and this is the you know, non-academic packet, which means you know, the administration packet, or this is engineering packet. So you could say any policy at, and the switch will enforce that policy. So that is how OpenFlow was bought, is by, you know, from the security route, they came down to that every packet will be checked at every switch, and there will be a rule which will say what to do with this packet. And then Martin Casado, he founded a company, Nisera. And um, there were other people who founded the company. For example, Guido is also Guido or whatever, Guido, Guido, he, he is also at Stanford, and he founded another company, Big Switch Network. And then Open Networking Foundation was found. Industry really liked this stuff. So they had a foundation which standardized the whole protocol. And in October 2011, first networking summit happened. And there, Martin, Martin Casado, again, the same guy, he came up with the idea of SDN. He coined the term SDN. So this guy is very smart and um, genius. Can you believe from SANE to ETHANE to OpenFlow to SDN? And he founded Nisera, and obviously he is worth a lot. He sold his company for $1.2 billion to VMware. So he's a billionaire now, I mean, maybe somewhere close to billionaire. So, so, so that is the history of SDN. Other companies have spent equal amount of money. Cisco has spent $838 million farming a company and buying it back, and so on. All right. So with that, let's see what, what Martin Casado really said about OpenFlow. So he said that we have every switch has control and data. So we should take out the control and put into a central place and only the data plane will remain in the switches. The switches have no logic to decide what to do, but basically they will have a table. They say that if the address matches or, or the, the header matches this, this entry, then do this. All right? And that table is filled in from the central place controller. And so the protocol between the controller and the forwarding element is called the open flow protocol. Okay? So if you want to ask something from the controller, okay, I have this packet, what do I do with it? So you send an open flow message. Similarly, if the controller wants to tell you that whenever you see this header, please throw it away, you, the controller sends an open flow message. So the open flow is a protocol which is spoken between the controller and the forwarding element. The forwarding element is this simple thing which just has the routing, which just has the table which says, if you see this, do this. Yeah, go ahead. So I would like to write down by the policy you can put a batch mode to the edge, which then, um, um, process the these composite packet tools that are real time transaction between the edge and the open flow server. Good. So the question is is it something the policy is preloaded or is it something in the real time you have to go and ask? And the answer is both. 
basically when the switch comes up and i have actually a whole diagram coming up as to how the switch comes up when the switch comes up the 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 controller may fill in most of the table so you already know most of the packets that will come in how to handle them but you never know some packet may come in which you don't have in the table what do you do then you send a message to the controller hold that packet with you the answer comes back then you send it off when the answer comes back so that is reactive and proactive is preloading so we have both prepaid and 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 you know what do you call that <laughs> postpaid <laughs> Prominently post prominently post prominently prepaid. And you see, the thing is, it is prominently filled in from the beginning because it is kind of delayed. The latency causes a problem. So when you have to fill in on demand, latency is an issue, and you don't want to do that. So problem basically it is filled in beforehand. Good question. And please feel free to interrupt uh, any time. Okay. So I think. Everybody understand this thing, right? Now, the only other thing is here is that this open flow protocol has to be secured because somebody else can send you a message saying that, okay, throw away these packets. So what do you do, right? So that is a secure, secure channel and they, they use just the same way like we do when we use web, we use HTTPS, which is SSL protocol. They use SSL protocol, which is called TLS, transport level security. So that, yeah. Um, so it's like chip switches. What do you mean by chip? You mean all magnitude um, with cost of the complex wrapper or half? Okay, okay, okay. Cost, I didn't say anything at all. Did I say anything about the cost yet? No. And I want to make sure that people understood that I am not saying anyone cost at this point. When we come to the point, I will talk about it. At this point, all we have done is taken away the control plane and put it into this switch. Now, since you brought it up, let me just finish that part. Basically, the idea is that the, the CPU now can be very, very powerful, right? And uh, it can do a lot of decisions very fast. And, and, and the switches are simpler because they don't have to worry about any decision making. They don't have to run routing protocols. They would be cheaper, but they are not cheaper. Really. Let me just tell you this part because this is a myth. The reason is the cost is not in the CPU. When you have a switch, the CPU is 10 cents. Really. The cost is in the TCAMs, in the table entry, which have to be searched at very high speed. Right? That is not gone. So, I, so the, whether something becomes cheaper has to be seen. And, um, and there are other parts. Pa pa Problems, right? But right now, I don't want to start all negative stuff. <laughs> so, so, so it's not cost the magnitude, it's not the magnitude. Yeah, right. The thing is, cost you haven't done much. Maybe the thing is, I've taken out something which may not be cost yourself. Yeah. Uh, could the reduction in cost be due to less software and much less complex in terms of software? What's going on? Okay. Okay, so for the time being, let me just be pro, 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 just speak as if I was Stanford. So yes, I mean, this is all simpler, cheaper, better, everything. Okay, and industry bought all this for up to a year. <laughs> so let's buy it for an hour. Okay, and then we'll come to the counterpoints. So first, let's understand the open flow. So open flow, Basically, version 1.0, there is a table. Every switch has a table, which consists of many rows. Each row has header fields, counters, and actions. The header fields are like, basically, you have to say, what is the port that it came from, the, the physical wire it came from? What is the source address? What is the destination address of the packet? What is the VLAN ID, IP source, IP destination, port number, you know, TCP port, UDP port, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these fields have to be matched. If they match, then you do something with the counters and you take some actions. Okay? Here is a simple example table. So if the port number doesn't matter, basically star. If the destination MAC address is zero, it begins with zero A colon C8, then 
you send it to port one. Okay. And increment the counter number 102. Counter number 102 will tell you whether it is a packet count or whether it is a byte count, right? But you increment the counter 102. If it is IP address 192.168 is the destination IP, then send it to port two. If it is port number 2121, then drop the packet, regardless of what the source destination are. If the protocol type is 806, send it to the CPU. Local means in the local stack, which means CPU, and increment the counter 444. If it is um, 0x1 star, then send it to the controller. So this is an example of a table where you are told some fields which are don't care, and some fields are you care. And so you match that accordingly and take that action. Yeah. This is first match policy at this point, yeah. Yeah, so if, if this thing matched 192, 168, then you are done. Okay, and th th this is going to change. This is version one right now. Sorry, just to say, what does yeah. it mean when it goes low to the CPU? What can happen there? Um, the local, um, local CPU will, um, so generally what happens is um, um, some things are going on a slow path and packet might be for the CPU, might be for this switch. Okay, so when a packet comes in, it might be going out or it may not be going out, right? It might be just some instruction that, okay, please tell me something, you know? So, so it might be for this particular CPU and somebody has to respond to it. That would be an open flow message. Uh... Okay, so this doesn't have to be open flow message. This could be a normal SNMP message. Somebody is sending a message saying that, you know, please change your configuration to this, okay? Now, open flow, generally, all it does is sends these um, table entries, uh, and it says what to do with just like this are this table. But um, in addition to all this, other things are running in parallel, you know, I mean, like basically people are, I mean, I, I will show you some configuration protocols, et cetera, et cetera, happening. Good. Any other question? All right. This is how the matching is done. Now, the problem with the matching is that the fields that I showed you before, they're not there in the packet all the time. For example, if you want to find out where the IP destination is, you cannot just go to the fifth byte and say, well, this is the IP destination, because first it depends upon what is in the layer two header. So you have to go header by header. First, you have to figure out what is layer two, and then figure out where the letter, layer three starts. And then you have to go into layer three and see where the layer four starts. Then only you can find the port numbers. So the matching is not just you got the packet, matched it, and done. All right? So what you have to do is you start from the top here. You find out the input port, which is easily available. Basically, it came on wire number one. And then Ethernet source, Ethernet destination, Ethernet type. You look at those. If the Ethernet type is 8100, which means that this packet has a VLAN tag. Right? If it has a VLAN tag, then we find out the VLAN ID and VLAN priority, and now take the ether type from inside, because VLAN tag has ether type too, right? You take that, and that is what you use here. If this was not a VLAN, then you take the ether type from here, and see if it is 0806. If it is, then you can find the IP source address because it is an ARC packet. All right, if it is 0806, means ARC packet, and so you can find out the source and destination right from inside the payload, and you're done. If it is not an R packet, then it is 0800. 0800 is IP. So this is an IP packet. And so now take the source and destination from those fields. Once you've collected those fields, then only you can do the matching with the table over there. Now, if it is a so IP and destination, you have to make sure that this is not a fragment. If it is a fragment, if it is not, not a fragment, uh, sorry, if it is not a fragment, then you can look at the layer four and see if it is six or 17, which is TCP or UDP protocol type. If it is TCP or UDP, you find out the port numbers and then you do the matching. If it is not TCP or UDP, is it ICMP? And then if it is ICMP, then you get the codes from there and then you do the matching. So there is this whole flow chart that you have to do, even though it is just a simple match, but that match is not just, you can get it like that. You have to do it step by step. 
Okay. All right. There is one more thing in this slide that I wanted to show you. That you more, might have more than one table. And if you have more than one table, you match with table zero, first table. And uh, you, if you match with any entry, like somebody asked, what happens if I match first? Done. That's fine. So then you are done. You do the action. But if you don't match table zero, then you can go to table one and try to match there. If you don't match table one, go to table two, table three, table n. And um, if it doesn't match any of the tables that you have, then you go to the controller. Okay. Counters. The counters are many different kinds. There are some counters which are per table. There are some counters which are per flow. There are some counters which are per port and there are some per queue. So first of all, let me just indicate here what is a flow? So each of these entries is a flow. Basically, every packet that has 0A C8 in the destination MAC address is a flow. Okay? 192, 168 is another flow. And, and so on and so forth. So each of these defines a flow. So for every table, you keep track of how many entries are active how many packets were looked up into that one and how many packets matched. For each flow, you have to keep track of how many packets were received on that flow, how many bytes were received, and how long the flow lasted. So when the first packet comes in, you make the time notation as to, okay, the packet is flow has started. And then you remember that as the packet comes along and the, and the duration is in two parts, seconds and nanoseconds. So you might know that, okay, the packet, the, the flow has been there for 10 seconds and 300 nanoseconds. Okay, so that is keep track of that. And per port, port is the exit wire, not the TCP port. The, the exit port and the wire, each port has many queues. For example, Ethernet allows eight priorities. So you might have eight queues, but generally they keep four queues. Okay, so you might have four queues per port. And for each queue, you have to remember how many packets were transmitted, how many bytes were transmitted, how many overruns happened. And for each port, you keep track of all these things which are listed here. Okay, so there's quite a bit and, and good accounting. And you know, basically you can ask any of these. Actions. So we move on to that um, table and now we, we know how to match the header. We know how to count. Now we need to know what the actions could be. Now the actions could be simply send to a port. Now the port could be one, two, three, four, five, but this could be a virtual port, which is not one, two, three, four, five. And these are the virtual ports. Virtual port could be all. Means send it to all ports. Basically send to all except the incoming interface. If it came from this door, other than that, it should go to all other doors for broadcast, right? Send to controller, send to local, Send to table, basically it says that go to table number five or whatever, right? In port, send back to the input port. Normal, use the traditional ethernet source um, learning uh, algorithm to find out where to send. And flood, which is send along the minimum spanning tree of the ethernet. Each ethernet network has a spanning tree. And so you send it along there. R and Q, into the particular queue, or drop the packet, or modify the field, for example, VLAN tags, and then queue or whatever. So these are all the different actions. Yeah. Uh, how is the spanning tree created? Yeah, the question is how is spanning tree created? Because you open flow, we don't have any control plane. So, so you might have, um, so th this is trying to probably this is trying to support some of the older switches, which, which is still is keep a spanning tree, and they have a spanning tree. Otherwise, you know, controller might give you the spanning tree. Okay, either you have your own, or you, same thing for the learning part. In normal forward using traditional Ethernet, that clearly says that, you know, just do whatever you were doing before. Does, does local mean that you so, 
So it could be it could be both. Generally, the say for example, let me show you when the, normally when the packet goes to the local stack without open flow. So if you have a tunnel, a packet comes in at the end of the tunnel, something has to happen to that packet. So it is sent to the local, right? And there you take out the out, outer envelope and see inside the packet where it's supposed to go next. That is another local action. Right? But here, here what they could do is, here in open flow, they could say, well, throw out the outer header and then go to table one. And then you look up in table one, what is the IP header and this and that and send to pack, uh, port number five. You know, that is a possibility, right? And that is one. And second thing is that it could just let it handle it right there, the whole thing, the, the tunnel and egress. So there is a management, there is a tunnel egress, and there are a few other things that need to be sent to the CPU normally. So normally the packets are sent at the line date, but there are some situations where you cannot send it line date, it goes to the local and then comes back. All right, actions could be masking, so, so basically you can just mask selected field, we already saw that. Um, if I think most of the things we have already said. If there is no header match, the packet is queued. The channel is secure. We know that they use TLS. And modern switches already implement the flow tables using TCAM, so that's already there. Controllers can change the forwarding rules if a client moves. So that is enough. So now we start seeing the advantages of open flow. Advantage of open flow is that you know the, the controller keeps track of the whole network. So if I'm here, it knows that I'm in this room, all my packets will come to this room. If I move to that room, controller will know that I have moved, all my packets will go to that room. So, so mobility is much easier handled here than you know in the self-learning environment where lots of packets will be dropped until they figure out that I'm over there. Yeah. I'm sorry, to inform the controller? Yes, what will happen is I go to that room then I, if I send any packet, it, that switch will not know what to do with this packet because it didn't have anything that says IP source this and that from this port, which is a new port, right? So it will ask the controller saying that, what do I do with this? Oh, so it'll say, all right, I see Professor Jain has moved to that room. And now I have to send new rules to everybody else that, okay, send it to that room. Yeah. Scalability. All right, we will talk about the scalability later on. Yes, scalability is an issue. All right, and um, the last line says about proactive versus reactive filling it. So controller can send the entries beforehand proactive or can send them on demand reactive, the question that was asked here earlier. So that is both are allowed. Now, there are lots of switches which do open flow implementation. And here is a list, and this is a very incomplete list because almost every manufacturer sells switches that do open flow. However, a lot more people use software open flow switches. And so there are lots of software that you can use that you, know, you can make a switch. And the most common one is on the bottom, open V switch. So I have a whole slide on open vSwitch. If you really want to do any experimentation with open flow, you start with open vSwitch because this is a piece of software which is open. Open means freely available. You can download it and, um, and then it does everything that you want it to do. It was done by Martin Casado, who else? And, um, and so the guy is genius, not only you know, designing protocol, but implementing things. You know, he really deserves that billion dollar. And um, so open this switch is used by all the companies, not only academics like us. It is a default in Gen Server in cloud. So basically, Gen Server is something that they use in the cloud or in the virtualization environment. So in a virtualization environment, you have a processor and you want to put six VMs into it. Each VM needs a virtual network interface, NIC. And those are connected by a switch to the real interface, NIC. 
So this virtual V switch is open V switch. Okay. And in all other computing, in all other cloud stack, this open V switch is used, such as Cloud Platform, Promo, Pro, Proxmox, DE, VirtualBox, Ken, XBM, OpenStack, OpenQRM, Open Nebula, Open World, whatever. So this is the switch. All right. We use it. And um, if nothing else, you can buy a $25 Raspberry Pi. $35 maybe. I don't know how much it is here. And uh, you can put this in that and you, you got an open flow switch. All right. So, so, um, so you can easily, very easily experiment with this. It is distributed with Ubuntu, Debian, and you know, blah, 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 everything. Intel has a version of it as well. So that is the switch you want, right? Um, what does it do? It does almost everything that anybody wants. The good thing is that this is open. So the open means that everybody contributes. If you do something, you put the code there. If you, ex if you extend in any possible way, you put it there and you, everybody else benefits. And so it has link aggregation protocol, which means if you have five ports combined together, they can become one port. You know, five, one gigabit can become one five gigabit. It has the Q VLAN protocol. It has the fault management, bi-directional file detection, and you name it. I mean, this is just the list goes on and it keeps increasing. It has, I mean, the list includes, of course, OpenFlow, but it includes IPv6, GRE, kernel, and so on and so forth. And, oh, I, I skipped this slide. And it has all the monitoring facilities. You can monitor it using NetFlow, which is the monitoring protocol. Um, you can monitor using JFlow, SFlow, NetStream, IPFix. These are all monitoring protocol. And, and GRE tunnel mirrors. What is mirrors means? Basically, the way we monitor things is that when we can say, whenever something comes on packet port number one, please send it to me on port number five, a copy of it. So the packet will come on port number one, will be sent to port number three, but a copy will go to port number five. That is how you monitor. Now you can see whether there's intrusion detection or something bad happening here. So that port mirroring is allowed, is implemented. All right. So. This is very powerful. And the way you control this switch is using a database protocol. And this is called OVSDD, Open vSwitch Database Management Protocol. And um, in a database management protocol, you need a server and a client. So the server resides in the switch, and the client resides in whoever wants to monitor that switch or control that switch. Right, this other way around. So server is not in the controller, it is in the switch itself. Because the reason the server is there is because you the control the, the clients, they call subscribers, subscribers can ask the publisher, you know, what is the status of this, what is the status of that, or you know, change this or change that, right? So the things are happening here in this switch. That is where the server is, OBSDB server, and the controller is outside. And um, so you can get all of this, you know, download free. So that is one good thing is that that includes the client and the server. All right. Now you basically understand how OpenFlow works, but that is version 1.1, 1.0. And most of the switches that you buy today on the market are 1.0. Okay. But they figured out that they doesn't do something. So they had to make a next version, 1.1. And um, so 1.1 introduced MPLS. So I am not going to explain what MPLS is. Most of you probably know MPLS, multi protocol label switching. And um, so the idea is today MPLS is used very significantly in all carrier networks. That's the only way you can get quality of service. And it, it, it requires putting a label in front of the packet. And that label is switched. Basically, is label is like ATM labels, uh, ATM network labels. And so that is very common. And that cannot be done here. Because in the old version, 
you could not do the label switching part by any method. So this one, to implement MPLS, they had to put something called table chaining and group tables. And the table chaining means that now instead of just matching the first one, I mean, basically it now goes to a chain. Basically you match table one and then it says, go to table three. And then it says, go to table five. So you might go through a whole chain of tables. Okay. And at the end, you might go to a group table. All right. And um, so, so that is one. What is group table? Group table has entries, many, many actions items. So it has, it says group table says that you can do one action item, first action item, second action item, third action item, or all of them. So if it says all, then you have to do each bucket, whatever the bucket says. Bucket is an action, not a counter, right? Bucket is an action. So you do all of that. For example, for broadcast multicast, you might just say, okay, forward to port one, forward to port two, forward to port three. Actually, that was very easy before. You could just say forward to port all, right? But now you can do certain other things. You know, you can say, change the MPLS label to this and then send to this port, change the MPLS label to that and send to that one. So MPLS levels are switched. So they are modified at every half. So here you can do all that before forwarding. Select, you do a selective bucket, indirect, execute one predefined bucket, or fast failover, just find the first live bucket uh, and send it to that live port. And th so th this whole group table business and the table chaining, now we can support multi-path. Multi-path means when the packet is going to the same destination, half of the packet might go this way, another half might go that way, or one port this way, one port this way, one port this way, one port this way. So equal cast multi-path we can do. MPLS we can do. We can do Q in Q. So the Q is 802.1 Q. 802.1 Q is the VLAN protocol. And so originally when the VLANs were standardized, there was only one VLAN. But just like MPLS, which has many, many labels inside, label inside a label inside a label. So you could have a label stack in a, in a packet. In VLAN, people decided they could have a VLAN stack in a packet. You could have a VLAN inside a VLAN inside a VLAN. So that is called Q in Q. 802.1 Q label inside an 802.1 Q label. Okay? That is just VLAN stack. Q in Q. And we can do tunnels. We talked about the tunnels. So tunnels are used when you when you go through an area where they don't speak the protocol that you want to speak. So you put the packet into another packet, which is a very simple header, and it goes through that area and then comes out at the end of the tunnel. For example, if you want to send a packet to Japan, and this is just an example, and people over there don't know how to speak English. So you put a Japanese header on the packet, send it to Japan. They will send it out to the exit port. At the exit port, they will take out the outer envelope, throw it away, and then English packet is back. That is a tunnel. And so, so this is what basically is that you put the whole original packet inside another packet, go through some area, come out, and throw over the external packet header later on. Tunnels can be supported with this method. All right. So this is 1.1. I think I finished, yeah. Then came, yeah, go ahead. It done, yeah. It doesn't go second and third. In the in the 1.0, once it is done on table zero, it is done. Yeah, what it means it finds a match, the action might be go to table two. Right. Now you have to match in the table two. Right? The At the end. Okay. So the last table might say, okay, go to the group table. And the group table is basically a set of actions. At 1.2, so we still didn't support everything. 
So we have to extend to IPv6 for IPv6. So one version 1.2 supports IPv6. <laughs> now IPv6, um, you know, they had address sizes are very different, 1.8 bit as opposed to 32 bit. Um, and um, other protocols, IBM, ICMP v6, which is the control protocol, IP control protocol, ICMP is different and so on and so forth. All of those are supported by version 1.2. And by this time, they realized that we cannot have fixed size fields. Previously, all these fields were fixed size. So now we have TLV, type, length, and value. So we say, okay, this is IPv6 address, length, 128 bit, and the value is so and so. So IPv6 address is very straightforward, but there are other fields that could be variable length. So you put TLV in the table. So can you look into the payload in the packet? So right now, so this is the thing. Open, open flow has a very specific field. So right now, say 1.0, you notice 1.0 um, only goes up to port 4. A level four port. So you cannot go beyond this. Right? So there's no way to say that look into layer five. All right? Okay, so so that is one answer, right? Second answer, I was just coming to this. Experimental extension. So they allowed people to put their own fields. So yes. You can put the experimental in, in, in this one extension and say, okay, I want to look at the layer seven header, or layer seven first data bit or byte or whatever it is. Right? But that is not part of the standard. Only your switch will speak it, not everybody else's switch. So is that related to the PLR you could, but again, your your switch and your controller. Open one flow one point three. Still, IPv six was not fully done, so IPv six extension headers can be handled by one point three. And you know that basically IPv six has lots of extension headers, right? MPLS was not fully done because there is a, there is a label stack, but at the end of the label stack, there is a bottom of the stack bit. So that is handled here in 1.3. MAC in MAC, what is MAC in MAC? So basically just like Q in Q, MAC in MAC means that you take an ethernet packet and put it inside another ethernet packet. So this MAC packet, which is media access control, inside another media access control, ethernet inside ethernet. And so that is supported here. Tunnel ID is supported. Now, there are lots of tunnels which are used in data centers, VXLAN, et cetera, is a tunnel. And per connection event filtering, auxiliary connection capability negotiations, et cetera. So there were, I mean, actually, let me see. Capability negotiation is the idea that, um, you know, when you talk to the switch or the controller, you tell them, look, I support only 1.1, right? So you need to tell them what your capability is that is supported here in 1.3. And um, what's the auxiliary connections to the controller allows parallel parallelism. So the thing is, if you send one request and you are waiting for it, send the second request that is waiting behind it, not a good idea. So you can do it in parallel. Second one might come faster than the first one because whatever reason, right? So parallel communication with the connection is, with, uh, with is allowed. And uh, you can connect to multiple controllers, et cetera. So these developments are the result of experience. Yeah, right, right. Right. If I want to know if I don't buy my switch. Right? I customer want IPv6. So we need to put it. Now interesting part is that the version one cannot be upgraded to version 1.1. 1 .1. You need a new switch. Yeah, it needs chaining, which was not implemented in 1.0. And it, so there are other features. So this is, so this is a problem. In fact, I mean, right now, it was in 1.0, let me complete 1.34 and then I will come back to that if you will. 1.3, 
Now suppose cookies. Now uh, cookie is basically the idea that when you send the request to the controller, you send them some more information so they can find it easily. Just like if we use cookies in the web world, that I send a cookie, they know that I'm Rajan and I just a minute ago I was doing this thing, you know, with you. And so, so there is a cookie here, which is a state, which is basically telling what this packet is relates to before. Duration field has been added to most statistics. Per flow counters can be disabled and enabled, and there are something called meters. So meter is simply but a rate counter. So generally counters count only bytes or packets, but the meters counts bytes per second. Right, so all meter is, there are two counters, one byte and one second, and you divide them and you meter. But the meter can, you have a, you can have a threshold, and the thresholds are called bands, so you could say if the packet, if the flow is in the band one, then let it go. If it is in band two, then mark the discard eligibility bit and then send it. If it is in band three, then throw it away. So basically you can do a rate control. Right, or you can do quality of service. That you know I, we have agreed to so much guarantee, then after this it is all available, you know, based based upon available business. And um, yeah, so that's all basically there is. You can do quality of service policing, um, and the bands basically are two types: either remark the DSCP, which means that you change the quality of service. DSCP is the differentiated services control point. So if you are using differentiated services, which is how you do quality of service in IT, there are six bits. You can mark them and, and some bits will mean that, some combinations will mean that this is very high priority and some combinations will mean that this is just low priority. So you can just change that depending upon what band the flow is in. 1.4. Uh, Okay, no. So uh, I, that will become a little bit more clear when we come to configuration. Basically, the idea is that if, if I have a 24 port switch, simplest thing would be, for example, I could say that the 12 ports belong to this controller, 12 ports belong to this controller. So I have two 12 port switches, right? So now having said that, now what we have done is we have taken a physical switch and made two virtual switches out of it. So now there is no reason that I could make that, okay, one virtual switch is this port, this port, this port, another virtual switch is this port, and those ports could be virtual too. So I mean like each switch can become many virtual switches and each virtual switch can have a controller. Open for 1.4, the main idea is that optical networking wanted to use as open flow, so that was extension was done. Now optical networking doesn't use packet switching, they use circuit switching. They use wavelength switching. Right, so that is supported in 1.4. In 1.4 it will say, if the entering color is red, send it to blue or you know, send it to port five. Right? You cannot look at any of the IP header system. Improved extensibility, TLV encoding, more, most places now. Experimental extensions are even extended more. And, um, and um, the, there are many reasons why when the packet is sent to the controller, there are some more fields can be sent, and so on and so forth, extension. So by the way, 1.4 is still in... Uh, in standardization means that it's not final. I mean, basically, it's the, uh, you can download the spec, but it doesn't say approved. Yeah. So easily, is in the experiment that automated drive can easily add ports, etc. So does that mean to an operational system, or to things you add them at the implementation phase? Right, does it mean that like, a system that's running and being built like an automatic driver system that's running? Okay, this one running on the third one down. Right. 
probably seen everything before you start. I mean, you know, and the, the part is that really your extension will get the, If they get out, then other people will not understand them. Right? And so this is, if you want to, this is more of more, you know, like, you know, when it's a stick thing, and some of them really want something to be done, that's what they get now. But I don't know what they're doing in any network. I know that. Negotiate all the capability in the beginning, right? And tell them that yeah, I just support your sister. Whereas last time, some of the execution of bundles. Yeah, then I'll explain. So basically, um, remember in the group table, you could do you know bucket one, bucket two, bucket three, bucket four. So there are four actions. But what if you were do, able to do one and two and then couldn't do three and four because the link broke or something happened, right? So they said, no, you should have the option. Some Either you do all four or you don't do anything. You re, retract back all. So that is called atomic execution, right? So a bundle is a group, group of instructions and atomic execution. Do it all or do it none. And switches can edit entries as well as important. And second thing was that you know switches can now switches some switches are very small memory, some switches are large memory. If you have a small memory, and somebody asks you you know for um, I mean some new rules you need to put in, then what do you do? You just throw away the rules which are not used. So that can be done. Yeah. What if there's copy Does that mean you Yeah. No. Wavelength switching. All right. That summarizes the whole development of evolution of OpenFlow. As you can see, starting from 2009, version 1.0, 1.1 in 2011, and so on and so forth. All the way to 1.4. The two versions I didn't talk about is 1.3.1 and 1.3.2. Those were big bug, bug, sorry, bug fixes. Other than that, you know, we talked about most of them. Okay. Yeah, ONF. No, no. Everything here so far, what I have talked about is all standard ONF. So all the versions are something that go through the ONF. Somebody says we should add this field, and then they discuss it and they standardize it. It goes through the whole review process and then approved. And then everybody implements it. And not only they implement it before they approve it, they just go through the testing and different vendors and see yeah, everything is okay. When everything is okay, then only it is approved. Yeah, this is mainly a vendor process. This is a multi-vendor process. Yeah. Yeah. So is there a thing that for the like Okay, so controller I didn't talk about. Okay, so basically this what they do is they do a plug test, and um, in which they will have multiple people's controller and multiple people's switches. And just like we talk about the extensions, so somebody may not speak HP extension, but they should be able to speak everything else. So they should be able to talk to HP controller, right? Yeah, depending on what version they're speaking. Yeah, so so basically if you have version 1.0, which is what most people have, and if you want to do any of these other versions, you have to buy any switch. All right, and that's somewhat of a, you know, what we call a bummer. I mean, in the sense that basically, I mean, we expected it to be software-defined networking, and here we have a hardware-defined networking, because you need to change the hardware if you want to change anything. <laughs> right, but that's what happened. Anyway, bootstrapping. Switches require initial configuration. And so when a switch comes in from the factory, it doesn't know who his boss is, what is the controller address. Just like any other IP, IP device, you need to put into IP device whether to do DSCP and ask what is your gateway, default gateway and IP address, or you just put it into hard code into it, right? So you have to do it in the switch. You have to put it initial configuration, IP address, controller address, default gateway, and then the switch can connect to the controller. 
when the switch connects to the controller, it says, look, I just booted up, don't know anything about myself. So it says, okay, put this entry on the table number one. And the entry is that whenever you get the packet from this controller with this field, which is actually, I'm going to explain in a minute, that says that whenever you get an LLDP packet, send it to all your ports. LLDP packet means link level discovery protocol. That is the packet which every ethernet switch sends it to all its neighbors saying that, look, I am such and such, and I'm connected to you. And so that way you find out who is connected to whom. In this case, the packet comes from this controller. The switch has a rule which says that if there is an LLDP packet, send it to all ports. Remember that all virtual port? So it goes to all the ports and it doesn't come back to the switch. All other switches are programmed that when they get an LLDP packet, they should send it to the switch. So yes, send it to the controller. So they all, your neighbors will report to the controller that we have heard from this new switch. Right? So now the controller knows who you are connected to. Yeah. Just a question. If you have an inbound controller, if, if the switch talks over the network, that the switch needs to actually complete the first instead of keeping it there, probably. I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so somehow it figures out how to back to the controller. The question was, Okay, if the controller is directly connected, so I know, okay, somebody programmed into me that port number four is controller, and I can just send a packet to the controller and say, okay, all right, you know, here I am, and what do I do? But um, if I am not, then the question is, if the controller is over there and I'm over here, then I have to know whether to send to this neighbor or that neighbor or that neighbor or that neighbor. And so somehow, you know, basically it has to be told that to get to the controller, this is how you get to. That's the question you have. Right, chicken and the egg, and so so that part I think the switch is um, um yeah I, I actually have to look up more maybe I, I don't want to say anything wrong here um, as to how it will figure out which neighbor to give it when the controller is not your neighbor. Meaning it's easy because it's all out of band control and you should have that button to try to do into Wireless network discovery. Wireless is easy. Wireless is everything is one half. It's multi -half, multi half. Yeah, right. You know, and um, yeah. So I have to I have to look that up. Actually, find out. Um, um, let's let's see one more. Maybe this slide will help. So so that is bootstrapping. The next protocol is called open flow configuration protocol. So this is a protocol which is used to program the switch. Okay, just like OBS DV, there is open flow con configuration OF config protocol. And with this protocol, you can tell it the IP address of the controller, port number of the controller, trans which protocol to use, what security thing to use, how many queues and ports, and, um, and so many other things. So you just program the whole switch using OF config first before it speaks open flow. So open config is another protocol standardized by ONF. And um, and then that allows you to configure the switch, just like OFSD, OVSDB allows you to configure a open V switch. OF config allows you to configure a open flow switch. And um, like we said before, you could have one switch which has many virtual switches. And each virtual switches could have a separate controller and a separate configuration point. Um, so all this, some of this is more of an idea rather than really everyday practice. So I don't know how often they use these things, like you know, have a single switch with multiple virtual switches, but this is allowed. And um, and we already talked about most of it is that every switch has many ports. Ports are the wire exit ports, and then each port has many queues, each queue has some memory, buffer space, and so on and so forth, and so you keep track of all that, and then each switch has a 64-bit ID, which is actually standard. Even before OpenFlow was there, each switch had a 64-bit ID, so that is somehow communicated to the controller that here it is. this is me and this is my ID. 
Now open config, OF config has also gone through many versions. Version 1.0, 1.1, 1.1.1, .1, and 1.2. Every time open flow changes, the OF config changes because there are more features to be programmed. For example, the initial part may not have to say that, okay, you have group and group table of size so much. Now it has to say group table, right? So, so you need a new version of OF config. So OF, OpenFlow 1.2 is supported by 1.0 of OF config, which means it will support 1, 1.1, and 1.2. And then 1.1 supports 1.3, and so on and so forth. Um, and you can see some of the other features. Um, assign logical con logical switches, certificates for security. Yeah, I'm coming to your question. Certificates for security is in 1.1. Capability discovery. So some of these things are missed before. But for example, capability discovery is very straightforward. Is that whenever you talk to somebody, you have to negotiate what is your capability, what is their capability, so we can have a common thing. So that is in 1.1. Uh, tunnel. And VFLAN tunnel, GRE tunnels, and topology detection, etc. Et yeah, your question. Is it, backward compatible? Is, is it backward compatible? So, so here's the thing. I mean, basically, um, let me see. Your question is: If somebody spoke 1.0 and if they got 1.1 message, what will they do with it? Um, so, I think, I think basically, this is easy to make backward compatible. Because if you don't understand something, you just throw it away. For example, if you get a certificate from the con from your configurator saying that please install this certificate, you say I don't know what certificate is, throw it away. But the old thing, which was basically that you put one table of size this and that, you put, you probably will understand that anyway. And then what is happening is with 1.1 onwards, we can tell them that look, I don't speak 1.1 or I don't speak con of config 1.1 uh, or you know something like that, right? So you can, they will understand that you won't understand 1.2, for example. So with capability discovery, then you can easily make things backward compatible because you speak their language, right? So now the next question is, before capability discovery, is there a confusion between 1.0 and 1.1? Uh, I think the simplest method, now this is, this is something that I have to check, but generally whenever you design a protocol, you decide one rule. What do you do with the messages which, which you don't understand? And there are two rules. One is that you ignore them. It means just drop them and do nothing. A second thing is you, you know, I mean, basically you declare some kind of, you know, real emergency and say, well, you know, I got this thing which I don't know how to do it and things like that. But here I think simple, probably they will do it is that if you are 1.0, you will ignore some of the things with 1.1 and other things, okay? All right, any other question? There's one more protocol. This is again, they realize sometime later that they need notification. What is notification? Notification is something that you tell your boss when they were not expecting an emergency call. So I'm sick, what do I do today? So notification is events that were not expected. So event triggered message, if the link goes down, and so this one actually uses the standard publish subscribe model, which is basically that the switch is the publisher and any controller basically who is a subscriber, which is allowed to subscribe. And basically it, the switch could check that, yeah, sorry, you are not allowed to subscribe to this. And so some controller could say, well, anytime your link goes down, please let me know, right? So whenever the link goes down, you let them know. So this is the protocol for that. And ITUT already has much of this built in, in a old, uh, uh, in old, um, what they call in ITU. Um, um, and anyway, M.37702, uh, I, I don't think they call it a specification, something, but anyway, um, ITUT. Anyway, so that, that one has all the notifications, those are all allowed. And then the previous versions had some notifications which were not part of this whole framework. This is a new framework. So those are also allowed. So for example, uh, packet in, packet removed, port status, error, hello. These are the messages that the original open flow controller could talk to the original open flow switch. Those are part of now notification framework as well. Um, 
I'm sorry? Yeah, actually, it is more than lagger because if the link goes down, you really have to change your routing cable. So, you, of course, you will log it, but I think uh, then, you know, it will recalculate something and send it to you some new tables. Okay. It's still the top of the Yeah, yeah. Network uh, troubleshooting, yeah. So now the implementation issues. 30 plus matching fields in a row. So you have to match a lot of fields before you know that this is the flow and this is the action, this is the con and then multiple tables, and there are many tables, and each with a large number of flow entries. Instructions and actions for each table, you have to keep track of, and you need them um, to support some of the other protocols such as VXLAN, NVGRE, et cetera, et cetera, which are not there yet. So you see, the, every time we have a new protocol, we have to change the open flow, right? So VXLAN and NVGRE is not understood. And for a large network, flow level programming can take a long time. Um, feature work items. Um, so the what we need is so right now the standard the the, the this the open flow is the protocol that is spoken between the controller and the hardware. Right, that is called southbound going down. There is a northbound protocol which is spoken between the manager, the user, or whoever that is, and the controller. That is northbound. Right? That is not a standard yet. And if you have multiple controllers, they need to speak to each other. That is called east-west protocol. That is not there yet. You, you can do high availability, but your own way, there is no standard. And ability to continue operation when the controller is down is not there yet. Because if the controller is down, if some packet comes in, you don't know what to do with it. Many other packet formats, such as non-IP, non-Ethernet, you saw the list. If they're not on the list, they're not there. Flow is the site. Now, the thing is, flows are good. Because you, you just, if suppose you have a long flow, then the first packet comes in, you go and fill in your table, and you are all set for the rest of the packets. They all go very fast. We call them elephant. Elephants are the big flows. But there are lots of mice. What is a mice? Mice is one packet goes and then nothing comes for a long time. Right? Request and response, a DNS request or something like that, right? So there are many request and response packets which just go once and then there is nothing following them. They require, they, they are delayed because every time they come in, we don't match them because they are not in the table anymore. We forgot them, we lost the whole rule and you have to send it to the controller and ask. So the Elephants are very well supported, but mice are, could be delayed, depend if you don't have too much memory. Yeah. So in all fair APIs, what sort of applications could we envisage that you'd like to run on the SDN platform? Okay, so I, right now I haven't used the word SDN, please. Okay, first of all. So now the question is, what kind of platform would you use on this one? So basically, I mean, okay, let me see. Um, I have at some point, which is basically I will explain, is that there are lots of things that you can do with this stuff, but let me come to the SDN first. Okay. Um, need API to encrypt data plane. Now, some people figure it out that the flows are supported, but what about non-flow, which is mice, right? And how about encrypting? So there are certain situations where you, when the packet comes in, it is unencrypted, but when it goes out, it has to be encrypted. Okay, how do you do implement that? So now you need the certificate and the keys and things like that. So there is a lot more for that, right? So encryption is required. Um, need to program an abstract view source to destination without knowing the physical network. So there are many, so there are some issues right now, which are, which are the future work item list. And you can find them, actually this is not my list, you can find them on a Stanford website. It's not supported yet. But I know. 
Yeah, at some point we will have to figure out whether to send it all the way. Because if you have to send it all the way, then problem is you have to send thousands of packets up and down and up and down. So can you do it at line rate then? Yeah? Well, IPsec, so the question is IPsec generally might be terminated at a host and not in a switch. It is more of a problem in a firewall or, you know, between two firewalls, things like that. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. So IPsec between two routers, you're right. I'm sorry, multiple programs? Okay, let me understand what you said. You said that the controller might be running some services and, and firewall is one service. So in that case, basically, the answer to his question would be that the packet is sent to the controller and the controller does the firewalling and then sends it back to the switch. I mean, that is a solution. I mean, I would say that, but that is the question I said, but if that is the solution, then... Um, yeah. Okay, so now you're you are asking question, comment, or... Is it a question that what do you do if you have that two services? Yeah, <laughs> yeah right, right. You, I think your first question was the answer basically was that, you know, you if you are going to do service in the controller, then both of them are only available in the controller because you cannot do one here and one there, and I think that will be very confusing. But, but this is all very arbitrary because this is not part of the standard, okay? So basically, if there is a service that you don't know, then you just send it to the controller and say, I don't know what to do with this. But are the controller could install a rule that says, whenever you get a packet like this, send it to me, and then it does the firewalling and XYZ and whatever else you need to do, and then sends it back to you, and then it says, okay, send it out. Yeah, so there are, see here thing, I, I'm going to tell you one thing, that please wait till I talk about SDN, because the things are changing quite fast. Open flow and SDN are two different things. I said that in the beginning. And so let me come to SDN, and then you will see how all this is done. Okay? All right, the open flow controllers. There are many, many controllers starting from NACs to PACs to everything else, and the latest one is ONOS. These are all, I mean, many of them are from Stanford. The ONOS is the latest one from the Stanford. And this is not a complete list. ONOS is Open Networking Operating System. And um, so basically, this is the controller, I mean, software. So you download it, and then, you know, you, you have a controller. Open Networking System, distributed open flow OS for a large WAN, you can have eight to 10 instances in a cluster. Okay, so what we do is, because reliability is an issue, we make a cluster of controllers. In a cluster, you might have eight to 10 controllers. So because it is a cluster, they somehow communicate with each other. So if anyone goes down, the others can take over. Understand? So this is how the reliability is solved, is because even though everything is centralized, but centralized in a distributed fashion, distributed to eight or 10 controllers. Okay? And um, otherwise, each instance runs for a part of the network. So, you know, the, even though there are, the, let's say these four people form a controller and cluster, so they will have their own area to manage. But if one dies, the others can manage, help manage that, that part. Um, and, um, yeah, and then basically the rest of it is just the architecture of that. They use some well-known techniques for database. Is it ZooKeeper? ZooKeeper is one of the database uh, distributed registry method. Mm -hmm. They use uh, Cassandra, which is another database stuff, and so on and so forth for keeping track of everything. 
And so, every, so basically, um, this is the reason you need all this database stuff is because you need to synchronize the data among many controllers, right? So you use the standard techniques. Then they also have something called Open Vertex, OVX, which allows you to virtualize in the sense that a switch, so you could have many, many controllers, and they could all control the same switch. Okay, yeah, good question. You said what? NetVisor. Flowvisor. This is the Flowvisor version 2. So the guy who did Flowvisor, he changed it, updated it, and now he calls it Open Vertex. So this is the latest version of Flowvisor. And what it does is it allows you to virtualize so that you can divide the network into many virtual networks, basically, you know, like partitions or multi-tenant issues. So one tenant could run this controller, which is Floodlight. Another tenant could run another controller called Parks. Another tenant could run another controller called Beacon. And they're all controlling this network, but the network is divided among these tenants so that when a packet switch comes and message comes from the switch, it goes to this open vertex, it, it knows who is the boss and sends it to that one. Yeah. I'm not following, sorry. <laughs> I'm not following that because I will tell you when we come to SDN, the whole story changes. One piece that you should really know much about is Mininet. So Mininet has nothing to do with the open flow or anything else that we are talking about here, but Mininet is a network simulation software. Just like, you know, so basically it is network emulation software. Using Mininet, you download Mininet, it's open, and then in one computer you can set up a network of any kind you want. You can set up a network with three hosts, five switches, one controller, whatever you want. And in this switch, you can install Open V switch. On that host, you can install IPv4. On this host, you can install IPv6. And you have the whole experiment ready. It's very useful software, and it works. OK? So first thing we teach our students in SDN class is Mininet. All right, so if you are going to do anything with, with with, uh, with, uh, with any of this stuff, download Mininet and start playing with it because that is much cheaper than buying a switch. Yeah. What's your experience with scalability? How many switches can you run inside? A Mininet? Yeah. yeah, depends upon whether you got a Cray or not. Sorry, did that say? I meant Cray computer. <laughs> <laughs> See, the thing is, on our normal laptop, like this, which are standard laptops, we can run four, five, six hosts, things like that. It's a small configuration. But if you got a really good um, big desktop or something, maybe you can do more. It's, it's, this, this is not something that you know is a fixed number, but basically it is usable that most of our research gets done with Mininet. We, we try to sort of push it to the limit. Yeah, no, yeah. We got to or more, we just run the discovery protocol with LMDP. And suddenly beyond 20, if we run nothing else with discovery, we see packets lost. And we look at these wire traps, we see this thank God in one switch. Yeah. This isn't the right address, this is the right link. Yeah. And that sort of happens from 20 switches. Yeah, so 20 is too big for me. <laughs> but, but, Yeah, but Mininet is very useful. So just like I said, download Mininet, download Open B switch, and you know, and then um, if you want to put a physical network, you know, you can just use um, these little um, uh, Raspberry Pis to make your switches and you know connect them together and have this little computer as a controller, physical switch and physical network. If you don't want a physical network, 
you can do with mini net virtual network right okay all right that brings us to the end of this part one uh, the summary of this part is that um, there are three planes sorry four planes of networking data control management and services and we talked about control and data quite a bit the open flow separates the control plane moves it to a central controller simplifies it simplifies the forwarding element so that is the whole idea behind open flow the switches match incoming packets with flow entries so the visari table match matching stuff and then now it has been extended to ip from ipv4 to mpls v6 and optical networks but there are many more protocols to be done there is the ons controller and ovx virtualization and mininet we know the tools all right so part 2 Part two is SDN and part three is NFB, as you remember. SDN, we'll talk about what is SDN, what are the alternative APIs, and what is open daylight. So how did SDN originate? Basically, the idea came from OpenFlow. And the idea came from the same guy, Martin Casado, right? Um, the idea was that he realized that if you have a central controller and you can change the program there very easily you can say well this network belongs to you this network belongs to me and so on and so forth we can program the network any way we want anytime we want so this the network has become software programmable and um, so that is called software defined networking and so initially sdn is same as open flow if you implement open flow your network is software programmable and that means to do SDN, you need to do three things. You need to separate the control and data plane. You need to centralize the control and you need to speak open flow. In fact, um, if you go to open networking forum today and see what is the definition of SDN, the definition of SDN is physical separation of network control plane from forwarding plane and where a control plane controls several devices and abstracts the control from forwarding. Now, the problem with that definition is everything that is in the blue tells me what to do, means how to do it, how to do SDN. It doesn't tell me what SDN is. And, and, the, and that, the industry had a problem with that one. Because if you just tell me how to do it, then uh, I'm limited. I have to go. If you just say go left and right and, and then you got SDN, then I have to go left and right. But tell me where you want to get to, then I can find my own way to get there. So if we knew exactly what SDN is, then everybody will find their own way to get there as opposed to telling me how to get to SDN. So then they started asking, what is it that we can do with SDN? And SDN is very powerful. With programmable networks, you can do virtualization. Virtualization, which basically means that I can share my network, I can you know, give you pieces of the network, and I can give other pieces to other people. Everything that we do in the cloud, we can do it on a network. Orchestration. Orchestration is like an orchestra. When you go to an orchestra, there is a director which waves a band. When he waves a stick, everybody changes the tune. Right? So orchestration means that you can do with one click thousands of devices. You can program a lot of devices with with you know a small effort that is called orchestration programmability obviously dynamic scaling means that we can change it anytime automate most of it much of it so that we have lower apex visibility we can monitor the resources mm -hmm. performance we can optimize the device utilization if some part of the network is not being used we can shut it down and bring the traffic over here multi-tenancy again sharing Service integration, we can put all the firewalls, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Openness. So now, the thing is, we need SDN for openness and unified management of computing networking. So much of this can be done with OpenFlow, but the thing is, can we do with some some other method? If this is what you need SDN for, the industry said, if this is what you need SDN for, then I have other ways of doing it. And so the industry came up with this model. And this is called open daylight. Now, open daylight has a different model of SDN than open networking forum has. Okay. In open daylight, you can use any protocol you want. Actually, not any protocol. You can put any protocol as a module. So, for the southbound, which is the protocol between the controller and the hardware, 
not only you can use OpenFlow, you can use TCEP, you can use SMTP, XMTP, BZP, Optlex, and so on and so forth. So there's a whole bunch of people, bunch of protocols that claim that you can do programmability with us. Okay? And the idea is that the, the controller is now divided into the, in, uh, there's a layer called service abstraction layer on the top of these protocols. So when somebody comes up with a new protocol, they say, okay, tell me what should I do? And so basically people, is, the controller gives the command to SA cell and the cell says, well, this device doesn't speak OpenFlow, it speaks TCEP. It gives you the TCP module mm -hmm. and, um, and then goes to the device a TCEP command. Okay, Some is, someone speaks SMTP, they can be programmed using SMTP, XMTP and so on and so forth. And some of these protocols mm -hmm. have been adopted as the only protocol. For example, Juniper this decided to use XMTP as their southbound protocol. So, so the side of spice is no more compiled by IPFI? Exactly, exactly. Okay. Now, why XMPP? And um, I, I will have a slide on that. Why XMPP? And and um, Cisco had just proposed Optflex in S IETF for the same job as OpenFlow. And um, and there are a lot of devices that speak BGP and so on and so forth. So now there is a big war going on as to what is SDN. And so we have a new version of SDN, SDN version two, which I call, and this is what is missing from the academics, is that most of the papers that you read on SDN, if you remove the word SDN and put the word open flow, the papers will stand exactly as they are. So they think that the SDN is open flow and open flow is SDN. But the message I want to give you is that open flow is one of the protocols possible. There are many other protocols and the industry is going in that direction. Open Networking Forum decided not to go in that direction. Open Networking Forum did not like any of this model. So the people left Open Networking Forum and they went to Linux Foundation. This work is being done in Linux Foundation. Okay. And every group in IETF that was working on anything else, they are working on SDN because their protocol can be used for programming, programming the network. So there are many groups in IETF, XMPP, ALTO, I2RS, PCEP that are SDN protocols. Okay, so SDN is everywhere. Everybody wants to take advantage of this interest and everybody wants SDN. Industry wants to sell SDN, SDN is here. Now one more thing I want to say, that if you define SDN with this definition, which has nothing to do with the control plane, flow plane, nothing like that, data plane, nothing like that in this picture. We all love these things. If I could virtualize the network, if I could program it, I could orchestrate it, why not? So that is SDN. If you define SDN with this definition, then everybody wants SDN and SDN is going to happen, is happening, and will, will allow you to do all this. But the question is, which protocol will be used in the southbound? Right? All right. So I call this model of SDN as no open flow, where no stands for not only. N-O, not only. This is like no SQL. If you, those of you who know big data, in big data they have no SQL databases. No SQL databases means you use SQL, but something else as well. Okay, so not only SQL. So I just borrowed it from there and called it no open flow. Basically, that means you can use OpenFlow if you like, but you can use something else. Now, what, how these protocols work? So, before I go to those, this is the debate in the industry. Question is, all right, if I want to do SDN, is really I need to centralize the control plane? Do I really need to centralize the control plane? And, and there are people who are saying, no, no, you need distributed solution if, if you want to, you know, have fail-safe operation, right? Then the question is, do I really need to remove the whole control plane? Can I leave the control plane in there? And there, are, there is an argument that you want to leave the control plane there because if you don't leave the control plane there, what happens if the boss dies? If the controller is gone, then you can't do anything, right? And SDN is easy if there is only single southbound protocol, which is open flow, then every, right? But 
there's nothing single in this world. There's no single network. There's no single protocol, you know, of any layer. Every layer has many, many protocol alternatives. And so this layer is same, right? There's no single operating system. There's no single hardware. So, so the idea is, so people are arguing for this diversity. And the history has told us that if the, if the industry will find an easier way to get there, the goal is good. SDN is going to happen. But how it will happen, what it will look like is the question mark, right? And so let's talk about such some of these protocols and we'll come back to the centralization issue. XMPP, what is XMPP? XMPP is Extensible Messaging and Presence Protocol. This is the protocol that we use for chatting. Whenever you send a text message to somebody, you are using XMPP. Whenever you chat on Facebook, you are using XMPP. Whenever you do you know, anything basically with Google Talk or whatever it is, you're doing XMPP. XMPP just allows you to send instant messages. Okay, how can this replace open flow? Right, can you imagine that? But some people came up with that idea, formed a company called Conrail and, and, and Juniper bought it. Bought the company, so I'm sure they, they got some money out of it. Anyway, so the idea is, this is a protocol which is very simple. Basically, there is a server and there are clients. Whenever the clients come up, they report to the server and say, look, I am on and now anybody can send me text. And then um, whenever somebody sends a text, this, the servers know where the other client is and then they just send it to the other server and the other server delivers to the client right away. Right, instant. As opposed to mail protocol, which is SMTP, simple mail transfer protocol, where you know the server gives to the other server and the other server keeps it until the client says, do I have any mail? If there's an a a email, it gives you. So the, so the SMTP is a pull protocol. XMTP is a push protocol. The messages are pushed to the client. Now, how can it be used? Well, it turns out the clients could be any device. Well, anyway, let me, before I go to that, let me finish what is on this slide. This says that XMTP is a well-established protocol and it is used in many places. And before OpenFlow, it was already being used for this purpose, believe it or not. It was already implemented by several vendors for management of devices. And uh, it is used in, in uh, Internet of Things and many other places. And Arista, which is going to be managed by XMPP and Juniper uses XMPP, right? So this is a well-known protocol. The way it is used here is that there is an XMPP server and all of the users, the controllers, the devices, the virtual machines, the switches and the hypervisor and P switches, they are all P, the physical switches. They are all clients, okay? Anybody can talk to anybody. Anybody can send a text message to anybody. And if they can understand the text message, they will do what you want them to do, right? So any device can talk to any device and say, well, please put your you know, forwarding table like this, or if you get a packet from this place, throw it away. All that can be done because all it is is a text message, right? As long as the text message have some meaning in it, you, know, you, you will do what they are telling you to do. And so, so this is how Juniper is doing it. Path computation element is another protocol, which is basically in MPLS, they had this problem some time ago where the com computing the path in MPLS is kind of difficult because you need to know exactly. So you say, well, I want a 10 megabit path going from here to there. So you have to know how much is being used and whether you have 10 megabit or not. So they said, okay, we'll have a server which will know all of this and will tell you what is the right path. So there is a path computation element server, which is called um, PCE, path computation element, which has the complete traffic engineering database. And then any router can send, which is a PCC. Every router is a PCC, is a path computation client. It can send a message to PCE and says, please tell me the path and you will get the path. This is very similar to OpenFlow, except that you get the complete path. So, so, so basically, if you have MPLS, this is easier to manage with this kind of protocol than with OpenFlow, where you have to send lots of entries. And the PC is well established. There are 25 plus RFCs, so that is um, good. 
energy protocol called forces forwarding and control element separation 2001 14 years ago these guys came up with the idea that we should separate the control plane from the forwarding plane and the control plane you know and so on and so forth all of these things that we are talking about today were there although it did not go too far but that is there in the forces world they said that we will have some control elements and each control element will will control some forwarding elements and so there is a forwarding manager forwarding element manager and there is a control element manager and so basically this works very similar to the way open flow works is that um, actually i will go to the next slide which is that basically the forwarding element manager is the first actually control element manager and does the security exchange so they know that they are talking to the right person and then it says okay here is my list of control elements and here is my list of forwarding elements so they they exchange that list with each other and then the forwarding element manager talks to its people which is forwarding elements and tells them look um you should talk to this controller so this is very similar to the open con of config all right it tells me that you know this is your controller id and similarly the control manager tells the controller that this is your these are your element that you need to manage so the ce manager tells the ce this is a control element that these are the things you need to manage and these are the attributes and once they each know who is managing whom then they can talk to each other do the security exchange and they 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 can basically do exactly similar to similar to open flow the idea is that these things have been around um and um so these guys are saying, look, I mean, we, we, we already know this thing, so we don't need new, new stuff. Then there is a group called Alto. Alto is application layer traffic optimization. Now, up until now, what they were doing was they were working on P2P traffic. P2P traffic is that bit torrent stuff, right? And what they were doing was the problem with the bit torrent is that if you are going to download something, you don't know where it is, so you just randomly pick your here and then you say please send me this bit of or this block of information and that block could be in, in, in USA or mm -hmm. China or something. So it would be really nice if my ISP told me that in Australia right here this thing is available, this movie, this song, this whatever I'm trying to download file mm -hmm. is available right here so don't go to USA. Right? So these people came up with a protocol where you can ask your ISP where the resources are which means where the things are that you want. And suddenly they realize that this is very useful because now we can go ahead and um, we can use it for um, network programmability because I can ask, you know, where the controller is, where I'm supposed to send this thing and everything that you do with open flow, you can do with Alto. So the Alto is being extended. Everybody is working on, you know, making themselves as the candidate for, for SDN. So the Alto guys are extending it. And um, now they can tell you the how much memory I have or how much memory you need and you know what bandwidth and things like that. So instead of doing P2P, they are doing SDN. So anyway, I think the basic idea was, and, and the basic idea was that um, with this definition, with this definition, we are moving forward. Today, if you really want to play with any controller, you should go to Open Daylight and download that. Okay, there are 30, I mean, there are, every company that you know of is behind it. So Cisco to HP to, uh, to IBM to, you name it, they are behind this. All the companies are supporting it. They are contributing the code. This is open code. It is being extended. This is not just one, you know, one mm -hmm. company thing. And, um, and then basically, if somebody wants to propose an extension, they can propose an extension by simply providing the modules and then, you know, somehow, you know, integrating it with that style thing. So this is modular, it can be extended, yeah. One more question about the synthesis. So if we, there is any longer protocols in this function, the controller, I know, I know, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, right, right, right. Okay, so let me summarize his comment. 
His comment is that this is too complex. Wouldn't it be nice if we just had one protocol and simple thing, right? So the idea is, yes, if I were going to do this thing, open daylight in my home, I would not implement any of those modules. Those modules are modules which I don't have to load. I could just load OpenFlow 1.0, 1.1 or whatever it is, and I'm done. Right? So all of these are options that are available to you. Now, so this is the situation. If you only have open flow switches and you have only 1.0 switches or 1.1 switches or something, you can just take that module and you are done. But what if you don't have open flow switches? What if you have an MPLS switch? What do you do? Now you have to throw it away and put an open flow switch or you have to somehow and do something. So this one allows, this one is good for legacy. This one allows the industry to keep their thing and you know how many billions of devices there are. How many routers are already in the field and nobody throws away the old stuff when they put a new thing. So yes, open flow is included as you can see, it's not only open flow, but a lot of other stuff which open flow cannot handle because it's not designed for open flow, they can be handled. So it's not, it's, it looks complex, but you can simplify it. <laughs> So, so, so XMPP is the way that um, Juniper has X, Juniper has um, selected, and um, so yes, I mean they, they, you can use Juniper equipment and you can program it the way you want it. You know, you can do some of those things that we talked about in the previous list, and. Um, um, let's see when we talk about it. Let me see if I have some slides which um, I need. I don't have them. So what I'm going to do is, um, since the discussion is going in that direction, um, I may use this other presentation which I gave this morning. Yeah, some of these slides are very interesting. You see, this is what the industry is saying. We don't really need to separate the control plane. This is what the control plane separation looks like. On the left, we have control plane separated. Means none of these guys, their brains have been taken out. And the only brain is here. Right? If you get any decision to make, you ask your boss. Okay? On the right side, we have centralization of control, but not centralization of control plane and no separation of control plane. Basically, what it is is this guy makes a decision and tells five people that look, our policy is not to talk to Iran today, and then our policy is to talk to Iran today. Right? Whatever he decides. Five people tell there, five people they tell there, five people there, five people, and suddenly the whole country is following that policy. All right. So now there is a centralization of control, which is centralization of policy. Right? But everybody has full brain. If something happens to the to this central person, the work continues. We don't need to depend upon, we don't need to ask them what is the policy today because the policy was told to you. This is the policy. Right? So, so that is the, the kind of argument that people are doing is that it really do we need to centralize the control plane. Right? We need to centralize the control. We need to centralize the policies. And control plane can remain where it is. So, for example, if you have an OSPF network, right now, if you need to do certain policies, you probably have to, because there's no central controller, each router has to be told that, okay, please change this thing and then change this thing, change this thing. But if you had a central controller, it could tell all of them, look, I mean, you know, our policy is to throw away these packets. And so that is, you know, somehow, you know, OSPF will, routers will do something in the routing table or whatever it is. So that is the idea is that basically we should be able to tell them and they should be able to implement the policy so the whole SDN is about policy implementation. Policies include security, policies include route, routing, policies include everything else. Um, 
So anyway, that slide is all I think I needed here. But um, yeah. Yeah. Is there a, a research challenge to decide how much intelligence should be in the following elements? So it's like open flow sort of on, on the extreme side, it's just dumb. And you're sort of saying it should more be towards the other side, but where is the solution? Right, that's a good question. So the question is, if we do want to cut off the plane somewhere, whatever plane that is, we should find a point where, where there's minimum damage done to the nerves. <laughs> right? Because if you cut off at a point, so for example, actually this was, there was a word here which I didn't manage, micromanagement. Open flow is micromanagement. Right? You cannot do anything. Like, just like you said, this is on this extreme where everything has to be asked from the boss. On the other side is where totally distributed, no central control, 100% in your decision. Right? And so, I think somewhere in between is the right place where you can say, well, all right, I think this much is your right, but if, if anything more than this you need to do, you please ask. You're, you are given authority of $2,000. If you need to make a decision for $10,000, please ask me. That's how the real world works. In the real world, we don't take away, the, we don't do micromanagement. Right? So that is how it is, is that the policy will have as a part of the specification what you can do on your own, right? And then there are exceptions. So that is where the SDN is going. So SDN is going, I again want to emphasize um, that remember this one. Oh, come on. What is happening? No. Okay, my computer is giving me problem. Now what is it? Window, window, window. Eh? Uh, my, uh, well, I need to go back to my original presentation, and this is giving every time I click something, it tells me. What is happening? Yeah. As a click closer? Yeah. Drop box. How does it that work? Exit drop box. Continue recording, and okay, window, UNSW, okay, thank you. All right, um, so with SDN, I actually there are no slides here, I wanted to just add some more slides, and that is that things can be done. Once you have centralized control, then a lot of things, centralized control of policies, by the way, I don't mean control plane, right? then you can, you have one place where you can do all the diagnostics, you can do all the management of health, so everybody reports and tells you how many packets they have sent, if you see some packets going in the wrong place. So all of those things have nothing to do with open flow, those things can still be done. Management is was centralized from day one, right? And so, so several, many of these things are very easy to do if you have the centralized control. So everybody is going for centralized control of policies. Okay, so when you go to a cloud, let's say you go to Amazon or if you go to any other cloud, Google's cloud, they are all implementing the centralized control by their own method. Okay, Google is implementing using OpenFlow. All right, Google is the biggest proponent of OpenFlow and every open networking forum uh, meeting and uh, you know, summit, they come and they tell you that basically we have, you know, we have just our own, they don't buy anybody's switches or routers, they just make their own switches and routers from PCs and they implement open switch and everything else. But most of the other people don't have that luxury. We cannot, you know, like, you know, if you are a carrier or if you are somebody else, you cannot rely on your own PC. I mean, you probably need some help there. And so, so basically, the, most of the other people have to buy hardware from some vendor, and they might as well then go to Cisco and say, please help me out here, and then, you know, do it, or, you know, go to Juniper, or go something like that. So, so the idea is only some people can support their own hardware. Most big companies will rely on somebody else. 
Okay. Um, so, so then the next thing that happened is network function virtualization, NFV. So I'm going to talk about what is NFV and what is happening here in terms of how it is related to SDN. But the idea is in NFV, very simple idea. So the carriers got together and they said, well, SDN is taking time and people are not agreeing and there's so much fight going on. What can we do? So they said, why don't we do some simple things? First is we can just use standard PC and implement all these functions that we need into a standard PC. We don't need special hardware. For example, you know, you, when you buy a, a IMS, you buy some special hardware. When you buy a broadband remote access server, you buy special hardware, we can just read on a standard PC and that is called white box, unlabeled box, basically, standard PC. So that is white box implementation. And then second idea is that why do it in a physical box? Why not do it in a virtual machine? So if we do it on a virtual machine, then I can send it to Amazon and just you know have my machines over there, or I can send to any cloud and put it there and I can create as many virtual machines as I need. So I can have the whole data center, carrier's data center, move to a cloud. That's all there is. And that is called network function virtualization, NFV. All right? So basically, if the NFV happens, then you will have, you know, boxes like it says, residential gateway, set-top box. These are all virtual machines, VMs, which are running on some standard hardware. And they are created on demand. They're created basically as needed, and they're scaled up and down. So you have all the advantages that you have, uh, basically, you know, of cloud computing in the carrier world. So the virtual machine implementation and standard hardware. So basically, in November 2012, HC basically started work on this. And the idea is that they will standardize the APIs for these virtual machines. So you can buy a virtual machine from anybody machine one and machine two from another person, and they could talk to each other if the API is the standard. And now with NFV, believe it or not, once you do this, you can get most of the stuff that you are wanting from the SDN for. So virtualization is there, orchestration is there. Of course, in the cloud, we do orchestration, programmability, dynamically scale as many numbers of the VMs as you want. Everything can be automated. Visibility is there. So most of the stuff that we saw before can be done, except few problems, which I will mention in a minute. But basically, this is something that you can do today. So the carrier said, we can, I mean, I can, we can do this if we can somehow you know, write these virtual machines, then we can do it today. We don't need to have a new standard done for any of this. We do need the APIs, but other than that, we don't need a another one. So originally, when they when they wrote the NFV document, the first paper said we need SDN for this NFV requires SDN, but the second document removed SDN, and so second document says we can do NFV without SDN. So basically, you can do both NFV and SDN, and you can do SDN alone, or you can do NFV alone. You know, and, and so right now these are somewhat complementary. While there's so much debate going on about SDN, there's no debate going on NFV. So it's not solved, but everybody accepts it. It's like this. We have so much debate about different things, but we have no debate about clouds. When the clouds first came in, everybody said, oh, I will leave, lose my privacy, I will lose my data, this and that. I don't want to go to the cloud. The banks will not use the clouds, but today every bank will use cloud. Right? Today, we just somehow trust cloud. And, I mean, your iPhone, my Android, everything is just in the cloud. Right? And so, how come? Basically, the cloud is now given. So, so this is what it is. is there's no dis question about the cloud. And um, so, functions are like this. You could have a router. You could have a home location register. You could have a serving gateway support node, SGSN, CGSN, radio network controller. All of these can be virtualized. And the advantage is with this, with this, you can have a carrier in a day. Suppose you want to start a wireless company. If all of this was available as a virtual machine, you could just call up Amazon and say, look, put up these five virtual machines and you know, put all this brass, you know, this and that, and here, you know, and then you could obviously you would need some base station, which are also virtualizable. 
So you could get, get a base station granted, a virtual base station, which means a base station being shared, and you have a company, right? Now, both of them are kind of happy because the person who is renting it is happy because they, they don't need real hardware and it's much cheaper, much faster. And the person who is renting out is happy because they are getting money out of this. So it's, it's cloud is the same thing. The cloud provider is very happy. I mean, Amazon is very happy with the cloud. And we are very happy with the cloud because we don't have to spend that much money. It's a win-win situation. That's the kind of thing which is NFB is, right? So NFB, in Etsy, they have four groups. One group is working on the architecture. One group is working on the management. One group is working on the software architecture. And one is working on the reliability. Then they have two more expert groups, which are working on security and performance. All right, so, and they have written quite a bit of a specifications. These specifications are available five of these. These can be downloaded from Etsy. So everything is open these days and free. So you can go to Etsy, URL is right there in the bottom, and you can download these specifications. I will present the summary of each of these. First of all, um, they have introduced some concepts which are actually better set in the next slide. So each function is called VNF, virtual network function. So this is a virtual machine, this is a virtual machine, this is a virtual machine. So these are virtual network functions. And then you have a set of functions. Some functions have to be connected together. And so those are called function set. And then there is a flow diagram, which tells you that the, that the packets or messages or whatever you have, they have to go from here to there to that one. And this is similar to that your packet have to go to firewall. From firewall, they have to go to SSL uploader. From there, they have to go to this and that. So all these functions are, you know, there's a flow chart for the functions, how they are going. The hardware is physical and outside. And then there is a virtualization layer, which is like cloud layer, cloud, provide, cloud management software. And then um, you have this thing. So, so they have these, yeah. Okay, one minute. Let me go back to the slide. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Everything that is data is virtual. So one, two, three, four, five virtual machines. And so I've, I've basically used all of these network function, virtual network function, VNF set, forwarding graph, and the infrastructure. Infrastructure is the hardware, real hardware. This was in the bottom here. And this is their architecture statement. So architecture, now let's look at the architecture. Architecture says that you have the hardware, which is right here, computing, storage, and network. And then there is a virtualization layer. This is your op, you know, network operating system, uh, the cloud operating system. And that creates virtual out of this. So basically, from the physical, you get virtual computing, virtual storage, and virtual network. So when you go to somebody and you say, I need five VMs, they will give you five VMs, and then corresponding storage and the, and, and the network. So this is how the VNF starts. Each VNF uses some virtual resources, VNF1, VNF2, VNF3, and each of them have an element management system, EMS. So you can manage those virtual machines. And on the top, they have the operating support system. So this is the OSS, which the carrier uses right now. And then on the side, they have orchestration module, which basically takes one command and makes you know, thousand commands out of it for thousand virtual machines or whatever. And then the DNF manager for each, some of these basically, so they can talk to different EMS. And then at the bottom, you have virtualized infrastructure managers, which manages the cloud. And for each of these, like the carriers do always, they have these points. These are called reference points. So everything that is I am now in red here is a reference point. That is where there is standard API. Okay. So how the orchestration talks to DNS manager, how they talk to virtual infrastructure manager, how the thing talks to OSS. <coughs> All of these reference points, the API they have not been done, but those are proposed. And um, so there are these are the reference points. I think they were better shown in the previous picture. So for example, VISA. In the previous picture, we have VISA right here in the bottom. 
um, make the VA effective. It's right here, the idea. And, um, and the other points, so the, all these points, which are like NFDI and VE, VNF, those are listed in the next slides. There are total, you know, eight reference points. And then there is a service reference, nine reference points total, right? So all of these are being worked on right now. And um, then there's a document on requirements, which says Apple, per, Apple Pie and Motherboard, basically that Whatever we do has to be general, has to be portable, has to have high performance, has to be elastic, means we can scale it, resilient, should work after failures, it should be secure, and service continuity. So this is all, you know, I mean, there's nothing magic here. If we did anything, we should have all these properties. So you said that um, OpenFlow is not FDN. So you yeah. started by OpenFlow as N3? No, it has nothing to do with actually, NFD has, yeah, it's not part of OpenFlow. OpenFlow is not part of NFD. NFD is simple idea which says that we will put it into the cloud. So there's no elastic network involved in the NFD concept. So having between the machines. Yeah, so I'm coming to that point. Routing between machines is an issue. I'm going to come to that point. And the requirements continue that, you know, the everything we should be able to fall detect to whatever they come up with. They haven't come up with the the whole those um, um, reference points and that means API. When they come up, the API will satisfy these requirements, which is that service assurance will be there, energy efficiency will be there, and you should be able to transition from current to next and so on and so forth. But the interesting thing is that they want to apply this, so they have identified applications. So they want to apply NFD to create these things. Virtualization of PDN, uh, you know, virtualization of mobile core network, our NFV infrastructure as a service, which is like, you know, the example that I talked about, a carrier renting out to other carriers, NFV infrastructure as a service. So all of these applications, these are all the ideas that they want to apply to once they come up with the solution. Now, remember, this is not very old. This is just November 2012, so hardly a year and a half. But they have come up with many examples in the sense that, for example, British Telecom has already implemented a VM that implements broadband remote access server, BRAS. British Telecom has come up with in this IMS, and Orange Silicon Valley, which is another telecom, has done ETC, and so on and so forth. So different companies are implementing virtual machines for different functions. All right. Now these are not open. That's the problem. So you cannot go to you know British Telecom and say, "Give me that brass." Well, they the, the the I know. So you have to buy. Okay. Yeah, that's why you have to go and buy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So actually, um, in the other. In the other presentation, I had another interesting slide that I want to share with you. And um, mm, let's see, window, wow, mom. Um, yeah. Soon there will be an app store for carrier apps. Huh? Yeah, well, these are big programs, so you, don't, you can't just write it in a day. I mean, this brass, for example, would require lots of people for lots of days, right? You know, IMS would require you know, lots of people. But the thing is, once somebody has written it, anybody can use it. Okay? This is a virtual machine, right? It's general purpose. And so, so now you don't need specifically every carrier writing their own IMS and I, their own, you know, things like that, right? Which is actually somewhat probably similar, right? Probably right now you go to Lucent, Alcatel, and they, they sell theirs. But so, so the idea is with this one, because um, there will be a lot more competition, the prices will come down. This is my hope. Okay. Yeah. Eh? For the carriers? Yeah, no, not for 
Yeah, yeah, for the enterprise, right. So the thing is, actually, so that was my next slide. I think that is on my next slide. Let me see if that, that slide is there. Continue recording. Window, go to NSW. Oh, it's not there. I'm going to come back to that. So basically, um, the the idea is that um, um, so NFV is good idea, but um, there are few problems. Not there for you, but but this this is part of the talk that I gave this morning. Um, the and this is available on my website. I already uploaded it, so you will find it. The URL is you can't read it, but it is. Um, you just go to talks on my website, you'll find it. So the idea is that while you can have all the virtual machines you want, but what is missing is chaining, service chaining. So if you put two IMS there and you want to connect from here to there, you need some way to connect different clouds. And right now that technology doesn't exist. So let me tell you what the problem is. Is that if you get something from, let's say Amazon cloud, put 10 machines there, and you get 10 machines from Google Cloud, you can't connect them. You know why? Because the only thing you have is a plain internet connecting the best effort. You don't have a 10 megabit link or one megabit link or anything guaranteed between the two clouds. Google doesn't want it and Amazon doesn't want it. If you have two Google Clouds, yes, you can connect them. Google has connected them already. So you won't even know where the VMs are. But if you have two different cloud providers, they are not connected. Right, And if you do connect them, then you have to pay heavy price because if you don't use the link, it cannot be changed. It cannot be disconnected. It is there forever. So there is no concept of, you know, virtual link, you know, or, or something that, you know, you can just rent it for a day or two minutes or, you know, and change the capacity just like you can do on the cloud. So computing is all utility, but networking is not. Right? So the service chaining is a big issue. And um, so IETF has started a new group called SFC, Service Function Chaining Working Group, to solve this problem. Actually, there are several issues and um, which have to do with the, with how you connect these. And, um, and, and this is where we might need SDN. Because um, if we had this network, which is in the middle, it was, if it was programmable, then we could program these links, right? So this is where the SDN fits in, in NFV. And um, so we have actually done this research. In our research, basically, we have looked into this problem where people are using multiple clouds. And each cloud, so basically, we have designed this software on the top, which looks very similar to Open Daylight. Our Open Daylight is right here. Open Daylight is right here. What we do is that you can manage your cloud by whatever you want, or one cloud is not open, one cloud is not by each issue, another by whatever cloud computing you have, and you have a network which is managed by open data. Right? Then anybody can use all these clouds and they can specify their requirements depending upon which cloud they are using, they have this module, just like you have this cloud bound. Here this is our cloud bound, all the way cloud bound here below again, but this is at least in the SDN. So, so basically, we just keep, so depending on which cloud we are talking to, we will send an open stack command for the open stack cloud to create as many DMs as you want and connect them the way you want. We will send the open data command to connect the create the link, and we will create the we will send the EC2 command to Amazon to create the DMs for you want, right? And so basically, this is the, this stack on the very similar to the SAL. That we had in open daylight, which was doing this. So you specify whatever requirement you want, and then it will be in this thing. The, this is a good concept, and it exists. We, we have a we, we are, we actually can someday you can download it, not today, but maybe in a, in a month or so. So we have this whole software worked out, and you can download it. But the problem is, this is very difficult to implement in practice. I'll tell you why. Because this wide area links cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and sometimes millions of dollars if they're cross-country or cross-oceanic. And if there are millions of dollars links, you cannot just program them every day or every minute because every time you 
exchange, you sign up for a million dollar, you need 10 signatures from the company. Right? And so, there is, so even if they can come up with all the technology to program the network, but there is no technology to program the signature. And, uh, and so, and this is large amount. So everybody wants to see the bill before they will say, okay, all right, it's okay. They, they will approve it. So it will take some time. Now people are saying that, look, we are already doing it. Let's see, what was the context in which we do it? Um, um, in, um, in some context, we already have things automated and the, yeah, right, the stock market. So somebody said, look, in the stock market, I give all the rights to my broker and he can do millions of dollars of transactions on my behalf and I don't worry about it. Well, when that kind of trust comes in, then maybe we can we can do you know this um, programmable ban. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a new set the Yeah. 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 So basically, not only that. Suppose I mean, you want to follow the sun, and then you want to go to China this time, and then you want to go to Iran, and then you want to come back to Africa, or USA. So you have different providers. So you just give them the command center now, and you move my VMs and and move them over there. Yeah. So now here the question of handover is that somehow these virtual machines are such that the state we can get back the state and then from 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 that state to here from new virtual machines can take that state. Okay. Right. Now again the same issue are there. You know, so there's the delay, there's the disconnection and things like that. So we have to do it in some, we are, so we being in universities, you know, we haven't handled all that detail yet. But right now we have come up with this model, and if you tell some, something here, automatically it will happen in the sense that the VMs are created by the rules and policy that is specified, and then if the load goes up, more VMs are created because by policy is specified, and so we, we do that. And once we show a demo part of it, and then we are done. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now the interesting thing is that we can we need all that that we talked about not only for NFV for FV. Actually, what is FV? So the so I argued I mean, this is my concept is basically that we don't really you need to remove N from the NFV. Function virtualization will be helpful to any industry. So if you are a bank, wouldn't you love to have just you know VMs which you can buy from the app market and put together and they will just do all your thing that you do for banking. Or if you're a stock broker, you could just get the VMs and put together, right? And in different clouds in different countries. Because you are global. Everything is everybody is global. Every bank is global, every you know stock broker and so on and so forth. So they could put into different clouds. So basically this function virtualization is a good concept and a standard. So that's why I came up with the Amazon app thing is that basically if it is, then somebody will come up with this um, VMs and they will start selling that whoever wants to buy, you know, I have this app for you. These are enterprise apps, right? They will not be two ninety nine. They will probably twenty nine thousand ninety nine dollars, but you know, <laughs> but uh, there will be market for that. Uh, that brings us to the end of um, our NFB presentation. So the part three summary is that NFV aims to reduce the OPEX by automation and scalability provided by functions in virtual appliances. So it has all the advantages of virtualization and cloud computing, which includes many of the things that we had on the list before, and um, including automation, hardware independence, paper use, you know, and then fault tolerance, etc. NFD, SDN are independent and complementary. Now we notice that SDN is required for the networking part. 
and um, NFD requires a standardization of reference points, which is not done yet. Interfaces need to be able to mix and match DNS from different sources. And NFV, if once that is done, then NFD can be done now. Right now, what will happen is I think they will probably have proprietary interfaces. So if you buy, you know, these virtual machines from one vendor, they will all work together. Someday they will work from different vendors as well. So the overall summary of the three parts is that there are four planes in networking, data control management and service. OpenFlow separates control plane and moves it to central controller, which simplifies the forwarding element. And SDN is the framework, but SDN basically is, you know, is saying that it, all we need is programmability and orchestration, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so then there's a competition. So while over OpenFlow originated the concept of SDN, but now there are many different APIs and so on and so forth. So Open Daylight is the controller to work with. So this is one thing is that, you know, I mean, a lot of academics are working on some very limited controllers, which only do one protocol. I think um, Open Daylight is the one to work with. And NFD reduces the RPAX by automation. Sorry, what happened here? Sorry. Wow, okay. So, NFD, okay. NFV reduces APEX by automation and scalability provided by implementing network functions as virtual appliances. So we know about that NFV as well. All right. Any question about anything at all which we didn't cover? Do, do you see any role for SDN on the end device? So some people keep talking about providing open switch and Android phones and things like that. Do you see any role there? Yeah. Okay. So the thing is, Open VSwitch on the Android phone. Open VSwitch on the Android phone. Um, so I'm I have to think about it because I I don't know how the Android phone is used as a switch. Um, so the, what they're doing is they're just using it not really for SDN, but they sort of manage network flow so they, they aggregate traffic from two different interfaces. So they they use it as a layer of indirection. But they just use it because it's there. They don't have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah, yeah, and okay. The controller at the moment there is just running locally on the phone. But maybe at some point you could imagine that. Okay, okay, okay. Run somewhere all else. right. First of all, the application that you just said has really, I mean, open V switch. Now, open V switch, as you know, is 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 a very general switch. Okay, and um, you can put open flow in it, but you can put OSPF in it. You can put anything in it, right? Open vSwitch is, you saw the list of protocols that it implements, right? So if all you want to do is aggregate different interfaces, then yeah, you can put open vSwitch and then, you know, put a program in there. This says that, okay, whenever you want to do this and if Wi-Fi is available, you know, use this percentage on Wi-Fi, this percentage on 3G, you know, 4G, whatever. So that is basically what it is, is programming the device, the big, making the dev device programmability, programmable, and what you just said is that the user could put its own policy. This says that never use 4G if Wi-Fi is available, you know, or you know some other formula, and and the phone will do that. So, yeah, it's an application of programmability, and we can call it software-defined networking because it is programmable. Yeah, but it's uh, yeah. so narrow. But you could then imagine maybe the, the, the carrier, mobile carrier, could control. Do Wi-Fi offloading and then okay, so Wi-Fi. So actually, that 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 would bring us to an FD module. So let me tell you what will what could happen. For example, so if you had a small cell device in my home, if I had a small cell device in my home, Pluto, what do you call it, femto cell, in my home, <coughs> the carrier could control, and I think right now they control anyway without SDN. They control it from their central office, and they could program certain rules into it whatever rules they want, whatever policies they want. And so, yes, <clears throat> so the thing is, what will happen is with some kind of SDN, maybe it will be much more easier and standard to do it than, you know, just every vendor, every carrier, you know, doing it its own way. So, so all of these things will help in the sense that SDN will help, right? <clears throat> and um, so let's see. I think that's a very good application. If you are a mobile carrier, or if, if you are, a, if you if you have just 
cell business. And it doesn't have to be femtocell. It could be even microcell. I mean, it could be any even macrocell if you wanted to do it, right? You could control lots of basic stations using central control. Any other question? No questions? Everybody, yeah. So, <clears throat> right, right. So you use the word play. So that is the time right now. Right now, the time is only to play in the sense that people are experimenting with SDN. And, um, and so I, as I said, you know, we, for example, we are experimenting with SDN ourselves, and you guys actually, I saw note, your lab is much more, you know, has a lot more resources than we do in terms of SDN. So right now is the time to do experimentation. All I wanted to say was that you start with the mini net, which is, you know, no hardware required, just software download, and then you can play with something and become used, you know, become used to open flow or you know, whatever protocol you want, open daylight. And you can put open daylight in Mininet, by the way. And so you can do all of that, and then you set up your um, your uh, test beds, which require you know, some real uh, switches and things like that. If you wanted to do a very small switch, as I said, you can even use we use and we are very poor actually, by the way, because in in in, in Australia there's a lot more research funding than US, believe it or not. But so so the idea is we use Raspberry Pi as a switch. That is our physical switch. We don't buy Cisco switch. You know, I mean, so that is $25 switch, and um, and we put open this switch into it. And there are other actually software that makes it uh, the open flow switch as well. Yeah. Okay, actually, so if you just do a Google search, now I forgot the name, but there is an organization in UK actually. Eh? Steve Roberts. No, I don't know the name. I think I think it was I was in an organization, and I can't remember it right now. And they actually have a software that we actually downloaded it, and so they they have a software that makes it an open flow switch. You just have to do Google search on that one. Yeah. No, 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 no. So the, basically, the controller is separate, right? So you, you download it and you, you need more than one interface on that Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi comes with one interface. So that's another little problem that how do you make two interfaces, five interfaces. So for that, we use the, the USB port to connect many, many Ethernet or wireless things to make it multi-port switch. Right? Now you got the switch done. Then you need a controller. Controller could be your laptop. Right? If it is a wireless, it could talk to that switch and do that. Now the question is whether that software, see the software is much more flexible. So I don't know that they do 1.3 or 1.0 or 1.1. That's very easy to change. See, because there's no hardware there. It is not very high speed or anything. So I would not be surprised if they do 1.3. I don't know whether I answered your question. I mean, your question was. The question was back to my slide about open flow. You mentioned that so open data is quite the best industrial solution. Yeah. So we don't want you know the industry to store very the existing infrastructure. Yeah, legacy. Yeah. Legacy. How we can migrate to from the legacy pure non-stream to pure stream. Yeah. So I'm thinking. So is that a way to update the SDN using? Okay, so the thing is, when you use the word pure SDN, you are talking open networking forum. They use the word pure SDN. There's nothing pure about open. <laughs> <laughs> so you are saying that, is that the objective is that we will move over to open flow based SDN? The answer is no. I mean, I really, I'm realistically, I'm just saying that the industry is going to adopt SDN and there will be open flow, but there will be everything else as well. And what you will get at the end is programmability. 
that is the goal. Yeah, and so so when you say, is this the way to get to pure SDN? I don't think we will get to pure SDN. You always have hybrid at some point. It's pure SDN. <laughs> Okay, NFV, um, I don't know whether you have anything like this. So sorry, I don't know of any of these. So all the work that is being done by these big carriers like BT and this thing, I don't think that is available public. So there is no open BMC yet. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I think this is a good time to take now end the seminar. And thank you. Thank you.